Okay. Um, so whichever that you think would uh, would help us climax. Okay. I mean, they're very unrelated, so I really don't mind starting with this. Uh, I'll just get this one out. Okay. Um, awesome. So let me know once you see my slide, and then I'll proceed. Yes, sir, we can see your slides. Okay, is it full screen now? Yes. Yes, yes it's yes. awesome. Okay, um, so let me start out by introducing myself. Um, my name is Charles Sudekwe. Um, I currently work as a manager in corporate strategy and business development at um, the conglomerate that's headquartered here in Nigeria. Um, it's an emerging market focused agribusiness and manufacturing um, concern. Um, and I've been solving problems for them for the past seven years. Uh, although that journey appears to be drawing to an end in the coming weeks. Um, I think it's interesting to look at international trade today because um, there's quite a lot going on on the global scenes. Uh, and I think a good understanding of international trade should help you um, digest the various um, happenings and enable you make informed decisions going forward. So uh, feel free to stop me at any point in the presentation if you have questions. Um, I will ask personal questions as well. Uh, I assume that you've come with some level of knowledge from uh, the newspapers you read and the conversations you've been having outside of corporate sphere. It would be good to hear your thoughts. Uh, the class will have a few class activities um, as well as the four lecture. Um, and yeah, uh, if you feel like there's any aspect of this that I haven't touched on very well, just let me know. I can always share materials uh, later on. I believe I have about 30 odd slides uh, to walk through. So we should be able to talk for 10 hours if you allow us, but I think I'll try to compress it into the shortest possible time. That said, um, let's start. So we'll be looking at a couple of things. Um, we're looking at some of the definitions, some of the core terms. We'll be looking at barriers to trade and the various aspects of international trade. Um, and then we will look at a few case studies uh, from my own experience in certain value chains. Um, it won't be a too theoretical, but we will delve into some of the core concepts uh, that underlie the concept of national trade. Um, yeah, so let me start out with a bit of a, uh, an overview. Uh, I mean, and the image you can see on the slide basically sort of summarizes um, what trade is really about. Um, the willing buyer, the willing seller, and Interestingly, the, a willing buyer only emerges when there are needs, and a willing seller emerges when supply you know, coincides with those needs. Um, and so interestingly, discussing international trade is really almost impossible if you don't talk about the fundamentals like money and all of that, but I really didn't want to overlabor the topic. So you will find that there are certain things I will not talk about too much. Um, I decided not to do separate slides on multinational operations because in our conversations, we will cover that to some extent. And then if there's any questions you have specifically, we can delve on that. And I also suspect that some of the other topics during the course should actually enable you sort of get a grip on uh, multinationals. But that's it. Um, if you have read through the slides, uh, basically, what you've seen is that people trade because they believe they will be better off uh, by trading than by not trading. Um, and what does that really mean? It means that you are able to focus your precious time trying to perfect skills that you are uh, especially talented for uh, while others do the same. And therefore, if you have a specific need, you're able to meet those needs by providing services that you are most best suited for, right? Um, and so international trade is very similar. It, it's, it happens, I mean, trade happens on multiple levels. There are 
personal trades, there are domestic trades, but there are also international trades that could happen between um, could happen between businesses, could happen between individuals, could happen between countries or governments. Uh, but in essence, it's an exchange of goods and services that crosses borders. Um, and, and of course, we know that the process of buying um, would ideally be called an import trade, uh, and that process of selling across borders would be called an export trade. It will be good during your spare time to look at the International Chamber of Commerce um, uh, Universal Customs and Practice for Documentary Credits. Uh, that, that's sort of the guideline that underlines international trade, uh, and it's, it's a document that will be good to look at. So when you're done with the class, just go on Google and try to see what you can read up on this and, and what you know, concepts you learn outside of what we've learned here. Um, the essence of trade is specialization. Uh, like I said, imagine if you had to meet every need you had by producing every single thing yourself. So one thing that will become evident is that you will spend every single waking hour of your life in trying to supply the very basic necessities. So if you need a house, you would have to procure all of the factors of production needed to build a house. You would have to specialize in every single aspect of house building. And then you would have to spend all your waking hours to build those houses. Um, and it would apply to everything else, food, you know, um, even the basic things you need for leisure, you would have to actually spend your own time building those um, you know, resources. So, Trade enables you to specialize and avoid having to waste all of your time doing that. Because the idea is that if you're able to specialize and produce one thing, then if that thing is valuable, you are able to then exchange it for whatever else you need. Um, and, and one thing that we've sort of uh, discovered over time is that specialization results in greater output uh, for, the end, for the whole. And that, so for every partner in trade, specialization will lead to a higher volumes of output than you would achieve if everybody was doing it by themselves. Um, so in essence, if somebody was to set up and you know, specialize in building houses, then you will actually have far more houses built if that person were to build for everybody else than if everybody was building for themselves. And the reason is quite simple. We would all have to learn on the job. We would all have to spend time trying to acquire those skills all our lives. But if you had a firm that has built, you know, the skyscrapers in Dubai, as well as the, you know, uh, the small chambers you have at Makoko, um, then in essence, that person would have learned every single rudimentary skill you need, and so you would have them do it more efficiently than anybody else can. Um, and yeah, like I said, these trades can happen between individuals and governments, between private organizations, between governments and governments, between you know, all sorts of parties involved in international trade. Um, so what's the rationale for, in, for trade or for international trade? You know, the uneven distribution of resources. Um, is one of the major um, uh, rationales. Uh, and of course, you know, what this means is that because resources are scarce, you will find that there is usually a deficit in supply in some areas and an excess of supply in some other areas. And so that just leads to you know, different fundamentals in different markets. And th these scarce resources you know, will ensure that we, we all need to look around and ask ourselves, what am I good at? What am I equipped to do best? And then look out for somebody else who can then produce what we need most. Um, and of course, another rationale, of course, is the cost of production, you know. Um, although climate and other factors, you know, factors um, would affect um, the, the cost of production, you, you could find um, that it, it's higher in one territory than in another. And then lastly, of course, is skill gaps. Uh, like I said, if you've done this long enough, you, you get so good at it that you're able to do it better than most other people. And so that basically then means you are able to do it at a cheaper cost, you're able to do a better job. So our first class activity. Um, what I've tried to put together here is the factors of production. Um, and I've tried to sort of um, drill it down to the various forms of reward that each of them can earn. I've given you some examples of what people have in previous locations classified under those factors of production. 
um, because it's a good good idea to understand this on a very fundamental level because it then enables you to see why trade has to happen or why trade happens. Um, so for land, you, you would typically imagine that that would include the bare land itself and all the extracted resources that you get from land. I've also put in energy in there because um, it, it does have a lot of similar qualities to land in the sense that you know land is the energy is basically converted from one form to another, but the energy you have in the universe is fixed, right? Um, and then the nature of acquisition of land for so what I try to do here is really to think about it from a personal point of view and ask myself if I needed this factor of production, what are the possible ways I could acquire it? And once I thought like that, it started to emerge that there are certain ways that some factors of production can be acquired that other factors cannot be acquired through, right? So for example, every single human being has a certain level, no matter how small or large, of inherent labor capacity. Um, whether the person is disabled or not, you know, and all of that may affect the level, level of labor the person can employ but, or can deliver or deploy, but we all have that capacity. On the other hand, some of us may not have any land. I mean, you could have been born into a family that doesn't have any inherited land, and so you would need to acquire it either by purchasing, leasing, or even by stealing it from the next fellow. I, I put theft in there because even though it's not a legal means of acquiring that form of uh, that factor of production, what I discovered when I was thinking about this is that there are some factors of production that can't be stolen, you know, and so it felt like it's important to point that out as well, right? Um, so, you know, speaking with land, you, you could purchase it, you could inherit it, you could lease it, or, you know, in some instances, maybe steal it. These are some of the ways that land is acquired. And of course, you know, in thinking about specific examples of resources that would classify under land, water would obviously go with land because it, in most instances, is a resource, you know, that's extracted from the land. Air and soil and livestock and crops and minerals, I'll classify all of them under land because ideally, you could think of them in some instances, especially, for example, livestock and crop as capital, but Fundamentally, if, the, if those livestock and crop were not, put, were not generated through any sort of commercial activity, so if I were to buy a plot of land somewhere in Zampara that has wildlife roaming all around it, I would assume that that's a factor of production that I, I would bundle into the land because it's an extracted resource. If on the other hand, there is a ranch that someone has set up and is now producing cattle and milk and all of that, then that would automatically shift it. So, to keep that at the back of your mind and then lastly the re the reward that land delivers to its owner is in most instances rent but there are some you know arrangements that could you know give you other forms of reward um so goodwill commissions etc there, there are some of the ways that land can reimburse its owner um i won't read through all the others because you have the slide in front of you and i will share it with deborah at the end so that you can all go through but these are some of the things you know that were running through my head when i was thinking about um, factors of production and how they relate to international trade um, and I, I think there's quite a lot of um, insights you could actually draw from this if you stop to think about it now so I, I decided to turn this into a class activity where i'll ask one of you to just tell me on the basis of factors of production how you think or what factors would be required to make an iphone it could be quite complex if we want to take all the time to go through every single aspect of it, but I just want to hear how you think about it, right? And for the most part, what I would want you to think like someone who is really just discovering the iPhone for the very first time. You, you've, you've sort of had a dream. Let's, let's assume you had a dream. You know what an iPhone looks like. You know exactly what components it's made from. But now your job is to bring it to reality. What factors of production would you think are needed for that activity? And then, you know, just walk me through how you would acquire them, etc. So is there anyone who wants to try this out? Have you guys been hearing me all this? time or have I been speaking to myself? No, so we can 
Yeah, awesome. So I just want one person to, you know, just try to tell me what factors of production will be involved in making an iPhone and then walk me through how you would acquire them. I just want to have your thoughts on how, how that would work. You need capital. Yeah, so just introduce yourself and then start out with uh, the various components you would you think you would want to put together and how you would go about doing them and then you know sort of link those to the factors of production that lead to them. Okay. Steven, I, I want you to talk very intelligently. So I, I'm not interested in just what you say. I'm interested in how you think about the problem and how you deliver your answer to me, right? So when you've tried this one or two times, I will tell you what I was expecting. It should sort of dovetail into the communication class, but um, yeah. All right, so go ahead, introduce yourself and then tell me what you think. Okay, sir. Steven, sir. For us to make an iPhone, we need, first thing is to raise capital. Then, yeah, please. Yes. Yeah, so you just give me your full answer before I ask you a few questions and then give someone else a try. Okay, you need I don't capital. want it to take too much time though. You need capital, you need labor, then you need entrepreneurs. You also need okay. land. Okay. Yeah. In fact, you need the four four factors there. Okay. So um you started with capital. Why, why do you think capital will be your first um go to or why exactly are you calling it capital? I, I was thinking you would have been more specific about what kind of capital you need, right? So tell me, what kind of capital do you think you would need first? You need a fixed capital and a working capital. No, I'm talking very specifically what kind of capital, not the category of capital, just you know exactly what would you need. I need capital to start up for mm. like, of capital. Okay, fine. So, Stephen, you're giving us your thoughts. Let someone else try it out, and then let me see if I can then, you know, give some thoughts on it. But thanks. Thanks for trying it out. And very welcome that everybody, you know, gives this a shot. Who else right. wants to try? Hello, sir. Hello. Yes. My name is Wanda. Um, okay. I agree with Stephen that we need capital, but I think in this case, we need technology and design intelligence. Um, first of all, we should have a blueprint of at least have the um, awesome, awesome technology. I don't want now. you to go too far. That's exactly what I was wanting. I was expecting to hear from him because when me, most people talk about capital, thank you so much, Wanda. When most people talk about capital, they are actually thinking about cash. Uh, and unfortunately, that's really the last thing you will need on the list of items. I'm not saying you will need it, but it's not the first thing you should worry about. So in the instance of trying to make an iPhone, the question you want to ask yourself is, you know, what exactly, what, how would I map out the process of building the iPhone? And what kind of knowledge is needed? So that, that would mean that there are certain kinds of technology, designs, et cetera, that you would ideally need to be able to bring an iPhone to life. If you have that already, you find that the journey becomes a bit easier, right? You're more confident about what you want to build. So just one second. Okay, so uh, are you guys there? Yes, so we're here. Awesome. So if you have technology and design 
things for making an iPhone. I'm sure that at that point, you would probably want to have a few people to do the work with, right? Because you don't want to have to be the one chasing every single vendor and every single um, employee. So obviously you would need a workforce uh, and that would be labor. Um, remember that in this particular instance, labor isn't only going to be described as the uh, most junior people on the production chain. It actually involves a lot more than that. Um, because the way I think about it, the entrepreneur is that person that conceives the idea. I assume that everybody else um, who doesn't have ownership in that venture is ideally part of the workforce. So if you have the idea to make an iPhone just like Steve Jobs did, or Steve Jobs did, you would want to hire other people to support you on this. And depending on the kind of compensation you give them, that to me would sort of describe where they fit in. If they are people who you have given almost equal ownership to start this venture, then I would put them under entrepreneurship. And in that case, you would then have multiple entrepreneurs. If on the other hand, there are people who take a salary from this and bear very little risk, then I'll put them in a workforce pocket, which is labor. Um, this, the moment you have that settled, I guess the next thing would be to sort of think about the land or, that you would need for this. And, and land here would involve a couple of things. So on the one hand is the location where you're going to do your production of the iPhones, but number two would be the raw materials you need, right? So I'm sure for the battery of the phone, you will probably need uh, lithium and some other specialized materials. So those would fall under the bracket of land. Um, and then, of course, at the same time, you probably need cash because to be able to acquire the land, you probably need to pay for it or lease it. And then some of the other resources you must buy outright. Uh, and as you begin to build out the idea, starting out from, of course, from the plan, which, you know, is sort of encapsulated in the design knowledge of the technology you have and all that. What would then happen is you will keep on, you know, leveraging the various factors of production at different levels. And... When you also think about it, you'll also realize that some of these factors of production will be things you don't have in your home country, right? I mean, so you would need to import some of them. And in certain instances, you may have to even set up plants outside of your home country, to produce the phones and all that. So that's where international trade would start to come into the picture. And that's why I felt that this class activity was really something that could help you start to see you know, where we're heading with international trade. And maybe keep this thought at the back of your mind, you know, even though we haven't fleshed it out completely, it should help us ask it for a couple of interesting questions when the time comes. Uh, so what are the characteristics of international trade? I don't know if anybody has any question up, up to this point. Hello, are you guys there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Does anybody have any question? Um, if you don't have questions, no. just tell me no questions. No, and then no, no, see, no right? questions. Sir. Awesome. Thanks. So characteristics would be um, that the home trade, uh, home trade is basically international trade that is happening within one geographic, I mean, it's trade that's happening within one geographic boundary. Uh, the moment it crosses that boundary, it becomes foreign trade. Um, it typically will involve, you know, different forms of participants. You would have, in some instances, you have agents, you have distributors, you would have, um, you know, all sorts of, you know, participants. We will look a little bit into this in detail. Um, but for now, basically, the understanding is that um, you, you will have a slightly different set of skills needed in international trade because of the complexity that arises due to the fact that this is happening across borders. Um, in many instances, you know, home trade is subject to excise duty, whereas foreign trade is subject to customs duty. Uh, and then you will typically need bonded warehouses, you know, in some instances to ensure that these goods are properly monitored by the customs agents in the uh, importing country and then before they are of course shipped up to uh, sales warehouses for the importers. Uh, the advertising is typically a bit more complex because 
you know, you will always find that in these instances, because you are crossing borders, there are language barriers you need to solve for. Uh, and in many instances, even the culture of the people may affect the kind of messaging that is appropriate in new countries. I'm sure some of you heard the instance where, I'm not sure it was Coca-Cola or a different company that, you know, sort of was trying to advertise their product in, in the Middle East and then it turned into an opera because the interpretation of something they had written looked like it was similar to a word in Arabic that they hadn't um, foreseen. So ideally, you know, it's a bit more complex to advertise in foreign markets than it is in local markets. In local markets, you sort of understand what exactly everybody needs and what they expect to hear. But it's much more complex when you cross borders. Uh, transportation is also a bit more complicated because remember now you are having to ship goods across much longer distances. The form of transportation becomes a bit more complicated. You really just can't put it in a truck and then expect it to land at the um, destination um, warehouse. You would, in most instances, require multiple forms of transportation in, in the same shipment. So maybe a truck loads it up at your warehouse and takes it to the seaside and then it's loaded onto a ship which travels with it for about three months and lands on the other port where it is then offloaded into a warehouse before a truck picks it up and then maybe moves it to the rail line which then picks it up and then ships it into the hinterland. So transport can be a very complicated aspect of international trade. Uh, research is very similar to ad advertising. You find that it's a bit more complex to understand foreign markets than it is in local markets. So you always need much more specialized support. Um, the markets um, are typically much bigger for foreign uh, trade because you are now dealing with a much larger geography. So it, it's something to always keep at the back of your mind. And of course, because you are now selling to people who in most instances will not typically use your currency, it starts out a whole different set of conversations around exchange rates and around availability of foreign currency and all of that. These are some subtle aspects of international trade that are very good to be aware of. So now for a sort of interlude, um, and the point here is that growth in international trade comes with trade-offs. You cannot import everything you need at cheaper prices and not expect it to have some hidden risks. Um, and so it's always good to keep that at the back of our minds um, as, as we all you know, graduate to become policymakers or people who support policymakers. It's always important to think about trade-offs. When you import a product from a different country at a cheaper price, because of, obviously maybe they specialize in this. So for example, vehicles. If you import your vehicles from Japan because they're really good at doing this and their prices are way cheaper than Nigeria does there and that, or if you import rice from Thailand or India or China because you believe that they have you know, a cheaper cost of production and you want it to land cheap at your country's borders, you must understand that there are trade-offs you are making as a policymaker. Uh, on the one hand is the fact that there may be, you may be exporting jobs which your people badly need. Um, and, and so that's something you need to think about and ask yourself, you know, is this worthwhile? Is this, is this is the lower price actually as valuable as the jobs that you're exporting as well? Um, and that's what they basically captured in this cartoon. You're looking at a couple who are looking at the news and realizing that because of the war in Ukraine, um, basically a lot of container ships are stuck in different ports across the world. And so there's maybe, for example, no more supply of baby food or no more supply of diapers. And now they have to look for ways to buy it locally. And maybe there's no company making it locally, in which case a very tiny product like baby food or like diapers can become a national emergency if, if it's not taken you know, into proper cognizance. We'll look at this a little bit later on. Um, so what do you think are the advantages of international trade? I mean, I would have called on you to answer and tell me, but I think since we're already on the slide, we can just look through the various ones I've outlined here. Um, so on the one hand, it helps you to dispose of surplus goods. If your country is overproducing a certain product, then it makes a lot of sense to sell it to somebody else who may not have as much of it. Um, it, it improves the diversity of options that your people have. So if you, you do already make the product, but you allow your people to also consider importing it then, there's a good chance that they may end up finding a variety of it that they prefer. You know, it, it has impacts on you know uh, social political um, goodwill because what tends to happen is the more you do business with people with foreigners, you the more you understand their culture and the, 
higher chance that you will be able to live at peace with them. When you close your borders to them, then the tendency arises that you sort of encourage more conflict. Um, the government is able to earn revenues from the taxes that are charged. Um, and then, of course, it can help serve as an augmented source of you know, materials during conflicts or during um, you know, natural disasters where you can import certain products you don't have and meet the, the short-term gap. Um, of course, it encourages cultural transmission and improves competition between local producers and foreign producers. So in an ideal world, right, international trade is a good thing. It helps everybody to drive specialization to the very best level so that you have the highest level of efficiency and you're able to earn you know, the best for what you do. But like I said, it typically comes with some trade-offs which you must be aware of and which you must decide you know, um, explicitly whether these are things you want to take or not. So what are the disadvantages? Um, you know, so what would tend to happen in some instances is that as a result of the fact that the amount of value you command um, at early, every point in the supply chain or in the value chain of this product is different. If you specialize in exporting unprocessed items, you tend to always be on the receiving end. And so for example, uh, I think cocoa is a very good example of this, where Africa produces, what, 60-70% of, uh, of uh, cocoa beans in the world. In fact, West Africa, not even just the whole of Africa, but just West Africa alone produces about 60-70% of, um, of cocoa beans. Um, but unfortunately, most of the chocolate processing happens in, in Europe. So what then happens is if you look at the value in dollar terms that these countries in Europe are able to command on the processing of cocoa beans that were grown in, in Africa, you find that it's way more than 10 times. In many instances, it's in a hundredfold more than what we earn in Africa. So what tends to happen is you will find that the cocoa bean is grown in Ivory Coast or Ghana. Those are the two biggest producers anyway. And Nigeria produces a very tiny quantity, but those countries will produce it and export it to Europe where it's then processed into you know, premium chocolates. And then the same African countries will import the chocolate back home. Uh, so when you look at the you know, balance of trade, if you export the beans at let's say $1,000 per ton, and then they process it and sell it back to you at the equivalent of $10,000 per ton, you can imagine how much value you have lost. And meanwhile, the chocolates are consumed mostly by those European countries anyway. So it would have made a lot of sense to produce the beans and process it into chocolate here in Africa and then export the chocolate to them so that you are able to command most of the value that is within that um, product at home. And then they can enjoy the product over there. But that, that has sort of been the curse of Africa. That we've tended to specialize in producing the very basest products with very little value add, um, partly because our leaders are quite selfish and in many instances haven't really thought it through. Um, but it, it has very, very significant impact on the livelihoods of people who work in those value chains. So, for example, if you were a farmer in um, Ivory Coast who, really, who grows cocoa for a living, they would probably struggle to send your children to school. Meanwhile, the guy who owns a factory in Europe where your cocoa beans are processed is able to live, you know, a very, very wealthy life because, you know, he's the one commanding the highest level of value from that value chain. It's a, it's been a big issue. It led, for example, a few years back to a conversation around what's called an LID on cocoa. It's called a living income differential. I think those conversations are actually quite... Forgive me, but I think they're very stupid because in essence, you, uh, what had happened was the government was lobbying the importer, the export, the importers of cocoa in Europe to pay an additional premium on cocoa beans so that the farmers can get a little bit more to support their, um, the, the, what they do. So it would work like this. Assuming that the price for cocoa at the time was $1,000 per metric ton, the government could say that you should pay a premium of 10% on it, which is supposed to go directly to the farmer. So maybe an additional $100 on top of the $1,000 per metric ton. Uh, and the, the idea was that you know, the farmer now has a little bit more to help himself. 
I think those conversations can be a bit twisted because in the long run, in the short run, yes, it does improve the, um, the farmer's output, but it doesn't really encourage any significant change. I can see a hand raised, so please proceed. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Charlie. Uh, my name is Nelson. Uh, the question I would like to ask is, how, how do we even come about the prices of the commodities in, let's say, our products in typical international trading, like in this case, the cocoa trading? Yeah. How, how does price development happen? Oh, Thank wow. You. That's a very good question. But yes, and I'm not even sure there's anybody that can answer this in the most concise way without, you know, some level of conjecture. But what I feel is that it tends to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. So previous prices tend to determine future prices on the back of pre prevailing economic trends. So in cycles where it's expected that the economy is going to do well, they would look at the prices that were sold last year and say, okay, maybe this time around I'm willing to pay a little bit more. And in instances where, for example, you were found that coronavirus was ravaging the world and people are barely thinking of or how to survive, and they know that nobody's going to be very excited about chocolate in the short run, then they, they'll be willing to pay a little less than they paid last year. So that, that's really what I've seen so far. It's not like there's any serious conversation between governments about, you know, what exactly it takes to produce. It is assumed that whatever the production costs were 50 years ago, it hasn't really changed so much, maybe a little bit of inflation, um, but they, they just expect that conversation to not have to happen. Um, but what would typically happen is that the guys who make these quotes on prices are typically the desktop researchers who would have had the historical price trends from the past 10 years. And the same way that crude oil prices, for example, would be forecasted, you know, based on technical analysis to reach certain peaks and then go from there. It's exactly the same thing that would tend to happen. So to your question, I think that's the way these prices have evolved. But I think I will go one step further to add that, you know, this is a really important question because I have personally believed that if you want to protect certain value chains, then you must take them out of just the day-to-day -day commercial trade. Governments need to sit at the table themselves and iron these conversations out and say, look, yeah, I understand that the historical trend was this, but I also know that you have the factories sitting open in Europe and you must supply your factories. If I decide not to ship out any cocoa to you this year, your factory will be shut down for the entire year. So let's talk. And at that point, you can tell them, look, we've looked at it and we think our cost of production at this point is X, but we also believe that we should get X additional you know, value to cover not just the farmers, but the other middlemen in the value chain. So the aggregators who will typically have to take it from the hinterlands to the market in, in the city. Uh, and then, of course, a little bit of value for those who will move it from those cities in the, in the country down to the port and all of that. And then lay it all out clearly. I think that that would be the only way to really drive significant value for producers. Because what ha tends to happen is governments are shy to go into these conversations because they know that what will tend to happen is that these large um, trade organizations, which in many instances have been, you know, tweaked to favor the big, the big boys, they are the ones who fund these organizations, they're the ones who pay the salaries, they're the ones who drive the agenda. They will tend to sit in those organizations and then, you know, give red cards to governments who they believe are not fostering trade. But what we don't understand is that trade in itself is not really beneficial to anybody. It really should be driven, you know, along the agenda of the, the producer. So I don't know if I've answered you, and if you also have additional thoughts to this. Yeah, please. Okay, no, thank you very much, Charlie. I, I raised the question because of, um, like, the, the, the channel, the, sorry, the arena that your conversation was heading to. And, um, of course, as you rightly said, is something that we need to really take a good look at because price discovery should normally take into cognizance the inputs that make up for the output. But in a scenario where uh, these are commodities, uh, it appears that the people who are producing it are not necessarily the one impacting on the price, but there's a, a, a kind of captive uh market so why without why one wouldn't go ahead to say that uh, other parties are determining the price but the power of the 
sellers to determine their price is very weak compared to the power of uh, those who are selling finished products. And considering that these are uh, maybe the false positions based on the kind of product that you're producing in the international trade community, one could be said to be wise or foolish based on the, the part of that value chain that we choose to uh, operate at. Correct. Right. Sure. Uh, so I'm not going to read through any of the other points. I'm sure you guys have had time to look through it. You can also read it up later. Let me not waste time. So let's move to a little bit of a thought experiment. Um, you'll be surprised that I actually prepared this particular slide before the Queen passed on. So when I saw this slide, I was wondering if I was being prophetic when I talked about King Charles Biden. It was just maybe a day or two before she passed on. But anyway, it was supposed to be a joke. Um, however, here's the thought. So you have two islands. Uh, on one, you have a few coconut trees that are supposed to produce coconuts for you know, consumption on that island. And then you have a lot of fishing boats. Uh, and what the people on the island do is they get on their boats, they go into the oceans and they are able to catch you know, um, fish which they consume locally. On another island that's a bit of a distance away, and the reason why I say a bit of a distance is they, these two islands don't communicate at all. Uh, the second island is much is a bit larger. They have way more coconut trees on them, and they have but they have fewer fish. Uh, and since there is no contact between the two islands, you know you can sort of imagine what supply and demand for fish and coconut is like on the two islands. So the thought experiment is: What do you think will happen if some navigational device now allows people to travel between both islands? Um, does anybody want to give it a try? Anybody at all? I don't want to, have to want to have to start pointing fingers. Just give me your thoughts on what would happen to supply and demand of, for fish and coconuts on both islands. It's a really simple experiment anyway. I'm not sure anybody should be shy to try this out. Anybody there at all? Thanks, sir. Still considering the... Yeah, no, just give me your thoughts on any one. You don't have to do everything. So if you start speaking about what you think will happen to demand for coconut on King Charles Island versus Queen Edda Island, then we can always talk about fish later on. So let me start by saying that on King Charles Island, because they have so many fishing boats, they will obviously have a lot of fish. And because they have few coconut trees, they have you know limited supply of coconuts. On Queen Edak Island, however, because they have so many coconut trees, they have a lot of coconuts you know, for consumption, but they have fewer fish because they don't have so many fish boats. But now there's not a way to travel between both islands. And of course, that means now you can trade between the two islands. So what do you think trade will do to the price or the, first of all, to the supply of these products and then also to demand? And how do you think that would affect price? So just let's just do it for coconuts. We don't have to do it for both of them, so we don't waste time. Can someone just just try? Hello. Yeah, yeah. Anybody, please. Wow, uh, okay. I just want to comment on the class. This one, everybody is quiet. So I'm wondering, is it that we are not... It's uh, Sunday, so class. I suspect everybody is tired. Um, but so yeah. People are, just, people are just lying down. I'm like, okay, Charlie should be talking. <laughs> I bet, we know that the quality, of the, the quality of the class is dependent on what you put into it, right? So yes, you don't sir. frustrate the source person. Thank you. All right, so who wants to just give it a try? You can be wrong, it's fine. I mean, we all keep saying that failure is a part of, you know, success and all that. And yet, you know, I see you guys unable to even try at all. I mean, if you try and you're wrong, we'll correct what aspect we think you may have missed. But maybe there's also something to learn from your own point of view. So who wants to try? Okay, sir, so let me try. My name is Wanda okay. again. 
Wanda, yes, um, thank you, Wanda. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so <laughs> I think that um, for King Charles Island that has few coconuts, and yes. now all of a sudden there is a new, there's an opportunity to get from Queen Edag Island. Um, yes. I think that um, the prices of coconut on King Charles Island would drop because now um, there's an opportunity to get more. Um, also, that's exactly what I was looking for. And it would be the same thing with fish, but just the reverse, right? Yeah. So yes, on yes, Queen yes. Edward Island, they will obviously have less fish, but because Queen King Charles Island has a lot of it and is able to supply to them, the price of fish will drop on Queen Edward Island. Now, on the other hand, if you were on, sitting on King Charles Island and now you found that there is, um, there is a place to ship out your fish to, it sort of means that you are getting additional demand for that fish. Yeah, a right? new market. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So a new market has arisen for your fish, which could mean that it, to some extent, it's likely that the price could go up a little bit for you. Again, you. yes, obviously, obviously. Exactly. But it will come down on Edak Island. And these are some of the impacts of international trade. What we just try to do is to simplify it to a very, 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 you know, basic idea so that you get the sense of how it works. Supply and demand still will always go govern prices uh, or, or, you know, price discovery. But in this particular instance, because a new territory has emerged that is sort of feeding into supply and demand on the um, original island, you will tend to find that price will readjust itself accordingly. Um, yeah, so there's a slide that basically tries to outline what you've just said. Uh, which is that domestic price of coconuts will decrease with trade on King Charles Island because now they have discovered a source of cheaper coconuts. Uh, mm. However, the domestic price of fish will increase slightly with trade because now there's an additional demand for their fish, right? Uh, and then on the same sort of the reverse will happen on Queen Edak Island. Domestic price of coconuts will increase a little bit with trade and the domestic price of fish will, you know, decrease the trade because now there's a much larger supply of fish coming from King, King Charles Island. And, and here, in essence, I, I try to point out that the total gains from specialization and trade are usually greater than the losses. But those gains do not necessarily go to the parties who lost welfare because of the trade, right? So it's a very important factor to keep at the back of your mind. There is a benefit to these two tri tri islands trading, and which is that the volume of... Um, the volume of trade that happens and the value of that trade it will be higher than what ha happens originally without trade. What do I mean? If you were to sum up the amount of coconut sales on both islands before they uh, get introduced to each other, and you try to compare it to how much coconut is traded when the two islands start talking to each other and start visiting each other, you will find that the trade will actually go higher than the sum of its parts. Um, but what will typically happen is that there are certain impacts that may not necessarily be uh, easily uh, construed unless you think about it carefully. So what do I mean? Now, the producers of coconuts on King Charles Island have been used to having low supply but high demand on that island. So they could charge whatever price they wanted and, you know, they would get buyers for their coconuts. Now, all of a sudden, there's a new supply of coconuts that's cheaper than what they are willing to sell. So what would happen is that the value that they can sell their coconuts for would have to fall to meet the international coconut price. And I'm calling it international because we're assuming that King Charles Island is a different nation from Queen Adak Island. And it affects them because now they are losing um, some level of value because of the fact that they are having to sell at lower prices than they originally did. Uh, but... If you look at it from the point of view of the entire island, by the time you sum up trade of coconuts and fish and like the activities that are, you know, sort of allied to this, it will be higher when trade starts to happen between the two islands. However, if you were sitting or looking at this from the point of view of the coconut producer, you would find that they probably would lose a little bit of value. And maybe, for example, the guy selling fish would have a little bit more value because they are selling more fish to more people. So what then ends up happening is that if you were the president of King Charles Island, 
you would need to find intelligent ways to compensate the losers because the losers here are the coconut producers on King Charles Island and the winners are the fish sellers on King Charles Island. They're now selling way more fish. Uh, and of course, uh, maybe even the, if you were to look at it from the consumption point of view, those who are consuming fish on King Charles Island will now be buying fish at a slightly higher price because they are now shipping out their supplies to a different uh, those who are consumers of coconuts would obviously now be buying it at a cheaper price because they are be able to import it from a location with much cheaper prices. So those consumers are winners in this particular picture versus the consumers of fish who will see a slightly a slight increase in fish prices. So when you look at these various producer and consumer groups, it's important as a leader that you are able to understand what each person is foregoing so that you can find a way to readjust those benefits. When I think about Nigeria and what happened when we discovered oil, I feel like that's exactly the same problem we had, right? So if, if you ask me, I, this is how the picture sort of plays out in my brain. Originally, every young person who came out of school could go, you know, pick up a piece of land and grow commodities that we would export. Then all of a sudden we discovered crude oil and then people started to get white collar jobs that were earning way more than a person could earn in agriculture in, in years. Because the oil companies came in, they set up shop, they were paying their people very well. Those people could hire maids and drivers and the like. So let's pick a certain random guy and say, okay, let's say that there's a Femi who used to be the son of a farmer. And... His father was just about to hand over his plot of land to Femi so that he can continue to cultivate it. And let's assume that at the end of the year, Femi's father used to earn about 100,000 naira as profits from the family enterprise. That was barely enough to meet the family needs, but at least it was sufficient to keep them going. So Femi went to a basically average school and all of that. But now Femi's friends who travel to Lagos have called him and said, look, if you come to Lagos, I guarantee you get the job of a driver or a cleaner that will give you minimum of 30,000 naira per month, you know. And by the time you multiply that out you know, for the rest of the year, you're looking at 360,000 naira, so, which is like more than three times what your dad is earning right now, right? So... Femi is now, you know, stuck with the option of either sticking to what his father does and earning 100,000 naira per year or going to look for this job as a driver and then earning 360,000. And so what, what happens? The Femi's of this world will immediately move to Lagos to get those jobs and abandon the land. And the reason why is because something has happened that has now incentivized those kind of white collar jobs and disincentivized for farming. As a leader, if you were a president at that time or you were in any position to make a decision, what you would want to do is to ensure that the benefits from mining uh, crude oil is somehow translated into a benefit for farmers in the villages. So what does that mean? Number one, maybe it means building better roads for them. Maybe it means improving access to credit for them, training them on better production uh, you know, um, methodologies. And then just finding ways to transfer wealth from the uh, commercial centers where, of course, most of the money from crude oil is going to those rural centers. So building good hospitals for them and making sure that you're subsidizing healthcare for them, building better schools for the people and telling them that if they will stick there and continue to produce, that they will be given subsidies to go to, to send their children to school. So that even though a few families will go to the city to you know, be drivers and all of that, you will not encourage everybody to abandon the farming implements and come to the city. Because you know that in the long run, it will hurt all of us. And that's exactly what happened. Everybody abandoned agriculture and came to the city looking for those white collar jobs until the entire agricultural sector collapsed. Because nobody thought about the trade-off that needed to be made. The fact that because you have now gotten the benefits of mining crude oil and selling it and making so much money, that you actually need to use that money to develop other sectors of the economy. So that's what this thought experiment is supposed to help you internalize and see from a very simplified point of view. I don't know if anybody has any questions. Yeah, I have a question. Sure. Okay, could trying to find out balance include um, refusing to enjoy all the benefits that accrue with the new revenue source? So, for example, 
Now, um, because they have gotten uh, money from mining crude oil, they could import commodities from other countries. In other words, they don't need to um, farm it, they could buy it, you know, because they're relatively cheaper compared to the other uh, costs. Could you include uh, insisting that I increase the pricing of agricultural commodity so that uh, artificially my people who are domestic domestic producers could earn more instead of just giving them handouts what do you think correct so i mean uh, we, we will come to that because that's actually a different aspect of this lecture uh, barriers to trade and that's exactly what that's about and it's a very valid point that what tends to, and, and I suspect that what must have happened also is that when the families of this world moved to get those white collar jobs, everybody started to produce those commodities, then we were left with no choice but to import. I mean, you're not going to starve, you must feed. And so if you've allowed that sector to collapse to a certain point, then you are left with no choice. It's now an emergency. You either import the rice or there's no rice to eat. You either import the beans or there's no beans to eat. So that it's really a very important point. We will delve into it a little bit going forward. But yes, definitely something that you know leadership must take into, take into account. I'm sure you will have noticed, uh, all of you, that I, I tend to let you guys take this away from just the classroom and try to internalize these. Because I, I suspect you guys will at some point become decision makers in various sectors, you know, of the economy, government, etc. It's important to understand these basic fundamentals. I, I suspect that part of the reason why our country has flopped so much is because our leaders don't really understand economics. And it's something that, you know, on the one hand is pretty simple, but it, you need to internalize these concepts. Otherwise, you will not learn to, you know, sort of weigh the impacts of your decisions when, when the time comes. So it's good to keep that at the back of your mind that as a leader, one of the jobs you have is to constantly identify the trade-offs that are happening when you make excuse me, certain decisions and then determine how to correct those trade-offs where necessary. Uh, so one hour has passed now. We will be looking now at you know, the various categories of international trade. I, I think you know, there's not so much to say here except that you know, those trades can be bilateral between two countries. And that's something that I think African governments have sort of unfortunately not done very well. And I, I understand it. I know that the rest of the world is sort of um, structured in a way that African leaders have very, uh, have very um, small voices on the global stage. Let me put it that way. And um, it's something we just need to keep at the back of our minds. There are some problems that we have as a continent that can only be solved when governments or nations talk to nations. It's really not going to be solved by normal commerce. Um, multilateral trade you know, typically happens within multiple countries. Um, you know, typically, you will have in some areas, you will have trade agreements signed between them, and that will sort of govern the kind of trade that can happen across borders for those countries. We talk about import and export trade. Visible trade is typically, you know, tangible goods, and then invisible trade usually refers to services. And what you will find in the current economy is that invisible trades are becoming a bigger and bigger slice of international trade. Um, I mean, we've been talking in the banking sector recently about the fact that you have so many young tech um, uh, workforce uh, or, or tech. Um, employees that are working for employers that are sitting across the entire planet uh, you know so people for example sitting in nigeria and working for companies in canada the uk the us uh, it's a form of um, exportation of services i'm not sure it's captured very properly in the setup we have but it's, it's becoming bigger and bigger and it's something that everybody needs to keep their eye on um so we'll talk a little bit about absolute and comparative advantage. I'm not going to talk a lot about competitive advantage because I will give that to you as an assignment. It's, there's a lot of material written about competitive advantage. Not so much about absolute and comparative advantage, but I'll just talk about those ones. And here, the concept was actually sort of promulgated by Adam Smith in his World of Nations, where he said, and I quote, the natural advantages which one country has over another in producing particular commodities are sometimes so great that it is acknowledged by all the world to be in vain to struggle with them. Uh, so he, he was basically trying to say that sometimes the playing field can be tilted in somebody's favor so badly that it makes it impossible to compete with them at all. 
the resources, the climate, the skilled workforce, etc. All of it can be, uh, you know, so endemic in a particular region that it just makes it impossible for anybody to start from scratch and compete with them in any foreseeable future. So he was basically saying in those particular instances that should govern the kind of trade you would be involved in. You look around you and ask yourself, what do I have absolute advantage in? And then in that regard, that should be what you specialize in so that you can add that to the rest of the world. But what then happened was that a guy called David Ricardo tried to extend Adam Smith's concept to a concept called comparative advantage. And in essence, what he was saying is that while a country may have absolute advantage over others um, you know, in certain areas, um, because it can produce that commodity better than others, he was also saying that when you discover that you have less absolute disadvantage, it is still advisable that you, your country specializes in producing that commodity. So we've talked about absolute advantage, right? And he's saying in essence that if you had the opportunity to choose between two, two different commodities and you look at the two of them and find that you don't have an absolute advantage in any of the two compared to a nation you want to trade with, what you should then look for is, do you have an, a less, do you have less absolute disadvantage in any of the two commodities? In that particular instance, pick that item and specialize in it. So let's, let's pick an example. Let's say that Nigeria was trying to trade with um, our neighbor, Niger Republic. Uh, and let's say that the two commodities we're thinking of trading are coffee and cotton. Let's assume that Nigeria can produce coffee cheaper than Niger, Niger Republic, but also can produce cotton cheaper than the Niger Republic. If you used Adam Smith's model, what you would think is that since we are both able to do coffee and cotton cheaper than Niger Republic, we should go ahead and produce both of them and export to Niger. What, what um, David Ricardo was saying is that if you were sitting in Niger Republic and you look at the two commodities, coffee and cotton, what you should ask yourself is, do I have less of an absolute disadvantage in any of the two commodities? So if I have less of an absolute disadvantage in cotton, meaning that I can marginally produce cotton better than coffee, then I should specialize in cotton and export it to Nigeria. And, he, and in essence, what Nigeria would then do is to say, okay, between coffee and cotton, I have more of an absolute advantage with, cotton, with coffee. And, and look, these are hypothetical, hypothetical examples. So ignore these particular commodities we are using. But since I do coffee better than cotton, I should export coffee to the Jerry public. And then since they do cotton better than coffee, they should export cotton. To and that's really what the concept of comparative advantage you know, sort of looks at. Um, so it's basically production of two comp commodities that are compared and then the better side is chosen as a result of its comparative advantage rather than its absolute advantage, you know, compared to a different producer. All right, so what are the sources of comparative advantage, you know, uh, things we've already talked about, factor endowments, technology, climate, etc., etc. Um, and so now we come to barriers to trade. Um, and, and this is, you know, sort of in line with what Nelson has mentioned. There are a couple of ways that countries have learned to sort of regulate trade with, across their borders. One second. Okay. So the first of them would be tariffs. Tariffs are taxes on, on imported goods or services. And basically, they help governments to raise revenues from the importation of certain kinds of commodities and helps to reduce consumption of the imported goods or services. Uh, and the effect is that prices in, of those imported commodities which are ta have tariffs on them would rise, and therefore, the cheaper domestic goods become more attractive. And, and in the instance where we, you know, we were talking about FEMI and the opportunity to travel, what would we have done in that instance? Now, assuming that we had successfully encouraged people like Femi to stay on the farm and continue to produce, and we found a way to transfer some of the benefit of crude oil mining to those communities where people like Femi live in, what we'll then do is to look at it and ask ourselves, how do we protect that industry so that it can continue to improve, you know, in the level of specialization that's there, in the level of value addition that's going on in that value chain, Etc. And one of the things to do would be to impose tariffs on importation of commodities. Now, the beautiful thing is that um, you would 
be earning revenues as a government from those tariffs, but you are also protecting your own sector so that people who are engaged in production in that value chain can actually grow with time to become more specialized, to become more efficient, and you know, until the point where they can compete with global markets. And then maybe that even becomes a uh, source of export revenue for you, where you produce more than you need and you can ship it out to other countries at prices that are even cheaper or equivalent to what they produce in their own territories. Um, quotas are another way to limit trade. Uh, in those instances, what you do is to basically assign quantities to specific people. Um, you can decide that, for example, we will not import rice for the next five years, but since we need a little bit of it, which people can eat, we will give two companies a quota limit and tell them to bring in 10,000 tons per month for the next five years. The problem with quotas is they can be abused very easily and you know you'll find in many instances that that tends to be the problem with uh, limiting trade limiting trade will typically in most instances lead to arbitrage and wherever there is an arbitrage you will always find that opportunities to exploit that arbitrage will automatically emerge smuggling is one of those you know mechanisms for exploiting arbitrage um, black markets and the likes um, so moving on to other barriers of trade, export subsidies are also another very effective way to control inflow, so inflow of commodities. So governments um, would basically provide financial assistance to firms to enable them to sell at a reduced price. It can happen in all such a varied amount of ways that we can't even delve into it today. But in in any economy, the government can subsidize any aspect of the value chain. It can come, it can be to subsidize production or subsidize consumption. You can actually tell you know, the producers to produce, and then when they sell to the final consumers, they can sell at a lower price so that you compensate them for the difference between the price they are selling and whatever the actual cost of production or the actual selling price you would prefer to sell at is. Um, but like we also know, it's very easy to exploit these. And that's why I'll go back to my earlier points. Every time you try to control trade, will most likely lead to a form of arbitrage. That arbitrage will get exploited, and there are so many ways that human beings have discovered to do this over the decades, over the eons. So always good to keep that at the back of your mind. Um, subsidies are typically paid by taxpayers, so you are raising funds in one way and then using that fund to sort of you know, subsidize it, either it's an aspect of the economy or a particular value chain, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, and another thing to also note is in many instances, export subsidies can be difficult to control in the sense that you're, you can benefit local consumers, but in many instances, that benefit is also exported along, right? So it's also a tool that is used for multiple results. It's not just so much about pricing. In many instances, it's that maybe you are looking at things like the amount of employment that the certain sector of the economy generates and then you're saying instead of having to shut down that sector we will subsidize them to export to countries where the demand is very high uh, and so those jobs that you know are needed in that sector are preserved because of the subsidy that you're providing to it um, but it's, it's really a very complex conversation Product standards are another very indirect way of restricting trade. And we see that every day. You know, sometimes a country will just come up with a new product specification and say that if your product doesn't meet social school regulation, if it doesn't meet this specification, that you cannot bring it into our country. And so it's a way of controlling trade. Uh, and the truth of the matter is because countries are sovereign, you cannot tell somebody that the rules that they have come up with should not apply. They can make up whatever rules they want to decide that they don't want to trade with you. Um, and then, of course, outright bans are possible as well. You can just decide that you don't want to import a certain kind of commodity at all. And yes, of course, like I said, it will typically lead to arbitrage, which means that some people will want to bring it in in ways that the government cannot control. But you know, it's something to think about. And then, lastly, of course, foreign exchange control. In essence, what you do here is because you know that the person who wants to import a commodity needs to have access to the currency of that country is importing from you can control the supply of that currency. And that could limit the amount of imports that people are able to do. Okay, so do you guys have any questions before we jump into documents of international trade?
somebody can just volunteer and say no questions so we can move on. Otherwise, if you do have questions. Thank you very much. Sorry. My name is Farida. Okay. Yes, Go ahead. Okay, so you made mention of, I think, Abitra. Yes. You, uh, from what I got, you said um, to the government, you said that you don't want to maybe import those goods. Maybe some people will want to do it. So is it legal or illegal? Are they doing it legally or illegally? Oh, no, no, no. So when I said exploiting arbitrage, it's usually illegal ways because if the government doesn't want something to do, if you go ahead to do it, it's illegal. But the point I was trying to make is that, unfortunately, it can be very, very difficult to control those um, methods of exploiting arbitrage. So, for example, smuggling is illegal. Or you will almost find that in every country in the world, there are products that are smuggled in. It is it's a problem that has spanned all time and will continue to exist forever. As long as there are human beings, and as long as you limit the importation of a certain thing, then people will smuggle it in. It's as simple as that. It's as, it's as true as the uh, concept of markets. So as long as you have people who need something and somebody who wants to supply that need, there will always be a market because people will trade. In the very same way, as long as a government limits the supply of an item in its territory, there will always be people who will want to make that product available. Those are called small glass. So it's illegal, but it happens all the time. Okay, so if if there's need, if there's a need for that uh, um, particular thing in that country, why then would the government, you know, want to hold back the importation of it? For any number of reasons, we've talked about quite a number of them already. I mean, it, it really like, first thing we've tried to um, elucidate here is that trade is a tool. And so as a government, your job is to ensure that it is working for you. Um, if you don't use that tool properly, it can actually destroy as much as it can create, right? So for example, and we will look at it in, during the case studies we'll be looking at, but there have been instances where trade has actually led to certain economies becoming you know, completely overreading with imported goods. And then you know, the people are out of jobs, there's a plot, imported inflation, all sorts of negative impacts of trade. And so because of those possible negative impacts, governments will, in some instances, throttle down on certain kinds of imports, but then they will want to maybe drive certain kinds of exports. And every time a government interferes in trade, it will have other consequential effects. So for example, part of the reason why you have so much rice that was being imported into Nigeria wasn't necessarily just because because there were governments outside Nigeria that were subsidizing those exports to Nigeria, that we're saying, look, we want that rice to go to Nigeria. We will do whatever it takes to make the rice reach Nigeria at a cheap price. And because we know there are people in Nigeria that will continue to eat rice for decades and decades to come. So to preserve the jobs of our people in those sectors, we will subsidize the rice, make sure it gets to Nigeria. You know? So, I mean, I, I can't go into every single reason why any government yeah. would want to free trade, but they exist. Those reasons exist. And because they do, governments have have legitimate reasons to protect their territories or to limit trade. However, what we've just said is that every time you interfere in trade, you will always lead to certain kinds of arbitrage which people will want to exploit. And the tools for exploiting those arbitrages have existed since you know man man ever existed. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so, thank you. Um, any other question? Okay, so we'll just proceed to documents of international trade, right? Okay, so uh, bill of lading, that will typically be a document that the shipping company issues to the export to the exporter. Um, it's, it's typically signed by the captain of the ship as evidence that he has received goods from the exporter. It's a very, very important trade document. And I would advise you go online and just try to look for samples of the bill of lading just to see the kind of information it contains. I didn't want to overlabel it. Not, I could have put in images of some of these things, but I, I really felt there's so much to cover that the rest of it is an old homework. 
Um, so, but of course, it serves three primary functions. One is that it's a contract of carriage. So, in essence, it specifies the terms under which the shipping company is receiving goods on the exporter and the terms at which he is now delivering it to the buyer. It says that they receive for goods by the shipper, meaning once this captain has signed the bill of leading, it is a binding document that says that shipping company has received those goods from the supplier. And then lastly, it's a document of title, and it's a very, very important aspect of this document, which is that anybody who is named on the document for the bill of leading can claim the goods. In, in fact, in some instances, it's so sensitive that when the shipping company dispatches the bill of leading, it's so heavily guarded because anybody who receives that bill of lading and can prove that they are intended recipients can actually claim the entire goods from the shipping company. So it's a very, very sensitive document. Now, in many instances, the shipping company will issue the bill of lading to the exporting company or the seller, and then the seller will send it to the buyer along with other documentation. So that once the buyer has received those documents, it is assumed that he is now able to go and clear the goods um, a certificate of origin will typically so, sort of define what country the goods are coming from and in some instances will help customs agents to sort of determine rules of origination and the likes. Um, uh, the certificate of origin is usually prepared by the seller, but it's usually also authorized by the local chamber of commerce or you know, some government authority so that when the buyer receives it, it's sort of a legitimate document that says that these goods are coming from XYZ location. Uh, the indents, if a trader is importing to an agent, you know, in the exporting country, then he will in most instances send what's called an indent to the agent. The indent is similar to an order, but it's not, not so official. It's not, in most instances, an indent is not an order. It will look like an order because it says, look, we're interested in buying this product, possibly this quantity, we're looking at maybe even this kind of pricing. But the job that Indent does is to enable the agent to now go out and look for suppliers and say, look, oh, I have a customer in Nigeria, he wants to buy this kind of product, this is what he's looking for, he wants it to be this color, he wants it to be this height, blah, blah, blah. And then people will either customize for him or say, oh, we already have that product. But the Indent is not an order, it is not an invoice, but it's one of those uh, sort of options. Documents of trade. Um, the pro forma invoice is quite similar to the invoice, but it does not debit. So in a sense, you can issue that kind of invoice just to give the person who is receiving it a sense of what the um, terms of trade would be. Um, it, it's usually sent when payment is expected before delivery to enable the buyer to obtain permission from the central bank to you know, sort of start to arrange funds and all of that. Right? Um, but maybe it's good to sort of... I, I'm sure that you will... Somebody else will be covering concepts of invoicing and trade and you know contracts and sales. Like that. But in most instances, when a seller issues an invoice, um, it is typically done through the ERP, which is the um, electronic um, record system of a company, right? And what the invoice will typically do is that it will, in most instances, uh, create a record of sale that can automatically impact the PL. So once I invoice a certain quantity of goods on the ERP, it automatically hits my PL as a sale. But the difference between a performer invoice and that kind of invoice is that the performer does not affect my PL. I can issue as many performer invoices as I want and it will not affect my a consular invoice is quite similar to a normal invoice, except that it's signed by the consulate or embassy, you know, to show that the, in which the, to which the goods are being exported. So let's say I want to ship goods from Nigeria to Japan, for example. In some instances, I will need to take the invoice I have just issued to my buyer in Japan. I will need to take it to the Japanese embassy in Nigeria and get them to stamp the invoice. So it's their own way of just looking at it from their own point of view, and ensuring that the goods are reasonably priced and that there's no undesirable good that is being that is entering into their country, right? Um, so once they have looked at the invoice and the terms of that trade and they've stamped it, then it means now that when I issue it to my buyer, he understands that some level of inspection has happened. So the government authorities are fine. Uh, yeah. The 
next very important document, and you will notice that I'm sort of jumping around on the slide just so that I can pick out some of the more important points earlier. On. Next important one will be the letter of credit. Um, and basically the importance of things credit and you know the importance get an assurance of payment of amounts due to him. So it's it's really a document of payments, right? Um, the importer asks the exporter to supply goods. The exporter agrees that provided the importer opens a letter of credit in the exporter's favor at a reputable bank in his own country, um, that he will supply you know, those goods. Uh, the importer approaches his bank for this purpose. If his credit is good, his bank will issue a letter of credit straight away. Otherwise, it will ask for deposit of the full amount of value of the import. And then the importer's bank which is called the issuing bank, will then write a letter of credit to, to its associate in the exporting country, which is the corresponding bank. Uh, and then, of course, the letter of credit then signifies that the issuing bank will pay to the corresponding bank the amount stated therein, provided the exporter meets certain conditions. Uh, um, so core concepts here are number one, the document will typically have conditionality about it. You know, if certain things are done, if certain conditions are done, you will receive XYZ payments. Number two, there are multiple banks typically involved in the creation of a letter of credit. One is the issue bank, which is the, the bank in the country of the, of the importer. And then the corresponding bank, which is usually a bank in the country of the exporter, but in some instances, it can also be in a totally different territory. Um, but in essence, the two banks are talking to each other and saying, look, I know my guy, you know your guy, and we are agreeing to transfer this amount of money to you on the basis that... Uh, your guy who is the exporter will meet certain conditions. Once he meets those conditions, you are free to, uh, I, my bank is free to release that amount to you. Uh, so the, but there are different forms of LCs. There are revocable and irrevocable ones. You know, a revocable one can be withdrawn or altered you know, without the prior consent of the exporter. So when I issue a, a revocable letter of credit from my bank, let's say it's any bank in Nigeria, you know, I can just go to the bank and say, you know what? Sorry, hello? Okay. So if I issue a revocable letter of credit, I can just go to the bank any day and tell them, you know what, change this clause here, you know, reduce this amount here and all that. But an irrevocable one, once it is issued, cannot be altered, it can only be destroyed. Um, and then, so typically very few people will ever talk about a revocable letter of credit. Like nobody wants to do anything with that. Um, and then, of course, a further measure of safety for the exporter would be to ask for a confirmed irrevocable letter of credit, which is guaranteed by both the issuing bank and the corresponding bank um, in the exporter's country. So when it's a confirmed irrevocable letter of credit, it basically means that you have entered into a contract with that person. And there are certain very specific ways that that contract will be consummated or exited. You can't just pick up and decide you don't want to ship anymore or you don't want to buy anymore. Once you have signed that letter of credit, money must move under certain conditions. Otherwise, then you will have to go to court and try to negotiate the document. A freight note is typically drawn by the shipping company. In the case, the charge for shipping the goods forwarded to the exporter who pays the amount, depending on the terms of trade, um, and then gets receipted. Uh, that receipted freight note is then forwarded to the importer together with the bill of lading and invoice, blah, blah, blah. Um, we'll talk a little bit about it when we're looking at the terms of trade. Um, and then last is the letter of hypothecation. Well, not last, but letter of hypothecation is also another important document. Um, it authorizes the bank to sell the goods being exported for the best price and if the bank cannot obtain payment um, on a best effort basis, which is drawn on the importer. Uh, that it has already discounted for the exporter. So the exporter in that case to make up any deficit between the amount of the discounted bill, proceeds of sale, and the less expenses. So excess excess expenses. I see a hand is raised. Yeah, hello, Charlie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for more indications, uh, is is indicating that the bank um, and the sh shipping uh, company play critical roles in international trade. Yes. You yes. know, uh, and that is both local and um, international um, bank, that is the bank of the exporting country. Yes. Okay. Is it possible to talk us through how this happens? Let's say uh, Mr. A, uh, Nelson, wants to ship to, let's say, China or India, and uh, he wants to ship to Mr. B in China or India. 
and Mr. A has a bank, bank A, B, and the other guy has a bank, B, C, you know, if we just, maybe it, it might make more sense to me and maybe to other people to just look at that process flow. Sorry. Yeah, yeah sure, no, no issues at all. Uh, let me go through the documents first and then we can talk about that. Um, so, of course, I will not waste too much time on all of these. You can read this later on the bill of exchange. Uh, it's also another form of um, uh, payment that is used in cash. Um, and then you will typically have things like weight notes, shipping notes, certificates of indemnity, airway bills, calling forward notes, ships manifest, stock warrants, and export licenses. So, look through that and then you will sort of get a sense. Um, now, I will come to the question you have asked, Nelson, but let me first of all finish with the terms of trade just so that people understand the basis by which it happens. So there's, there's a term called um, INCO terms. Uh, these, so these are usually revised every couple of years. I think the last was 2010, and then now it was revised in 2020. And basically what these terms do is they tell you the basis upon which a trade is happening, right? So if I say that I'm trading with you X works, what that means is that um, the seller would be responsible for having the shipment available at his location. And then once the ship, the buyer picks it up, it becomes his responsibility. It applies a lot to local trade as well. Um, so for example, if you want to buy right, there's a lot of background noise. I don't know, can someone just mute? So if someone wants to buy from your factory, for example, and you decide you don't want to get involved in shipping and arranging all of that, the person can actually bring his truck to the front of your factory and then get it loaded with your goods. You pay him X works prices and then you handle the rest of it. Um, I guess important to note would be you know, the fact that, of course, there are different levels of risk that everybody carries in these trades as well as responsibilities for delivery of those goods. Um, so it's usually quite good to understand those differences. One term you will typically hear a lot of um, if you get into, um, especially waterway transport will be FOB. So an FOB trade is a free on board trade. It typically means that the seller has committed to deliver the goods to the ship that will bring it down to Nigeria. Um, I'm using Nigeria now as the importing country, but the moment the goods have gotten into the ship, then the seller's risk, you know, sort of ends there. And the rest of it will typically require that, you know, you, this, the buyer then carries on the rest of the responsibility. So freight cost is paid for by the buyer, insurance is handled by the buyer, and then the risk for all of those products are handled by the buyer. Another very popular term will be CIF. Uh, some people just call it CNF. Um, but typically, it just means that the cost insurance and freight is handled um, in most instances by the, um, the, the, the seller. So he covers freight, he covers insurance. Uh, and remember, by law, there are certain minimum kinds of insurance that must be provided. So you can't actually opt out of insurance in international trade. Um, and then basically it helps to cover the buyer's risk of loss or damage to the shipment in carriage. Um, you can read this later on. I'm not sure that it will be very, very useful if you are not directly involved in international trade at this point, but it's good to understand each and every one of them uh, because you will find that as you review documents, uh, contracts of trade, or you look at bills of uh, lading and all of that, you will find these terms. So it's good to understand what each of them means. Uh, I was going to segue into multinationals, but I decided later on that it would really just distract the entire flow of thoughts. So now I'll come down to what Nelson was speaking about. So if we sort of make it a bit more practical, there are sort of three very different aspects of international trade that must be managed at the same time. On the one hand is the movement of goods, which means the shipping companies are really important. The other hand of it is the documentation, which means that you need to be clear on how documentation will be transmitted. It can be a nightmare. I've seen instances where the bill of lading of a shipping goods was lost, and believe me, uh, heads of road immediately because it, we're talking losses in the millions of dollars. So documentation handling can be very, very sensitive. And don't forget that because these same documents are reviewed by multiple governments, 
you need to be very careful what is written in those documents and what is not. Because sometimes five years down the line, they can decide to start an investigation of a certain importation you did. And they will want to see every evidence that you followed the rules of the law as laid down at that time. So keeping good records for very many years is very important. Ensuring that every document meets all the requirements of law is very important. I cannot you know, emphasize this enough. Then last of this is finance. And that's very different from the movement of the goods or the documentation process. That typically will happen between the banks that are involved. So we've talked about the issuing bank and the corresponding bank. So let's look now at sort of a trade flow um, for an importation in Nigeria. Like I said, there are three aspects to it. There'll be documentation, there'll be finance and the goods. The goods themselves are not too much of a difficulty. Once you get them in a truck and ship them to the shipping you know, uh, port and then get them loaded, uh, the rest of it is sort of automatic. So where, what you will find is that the complexity, the biggest complexity is actually in documentation because the documentation process will also feed into finance and then that will then feed into whether you're able to receive the goods or not. So we'll just walk through it a bit. So typically you will have what's called an overseas purchase requisition. Um, it's kind of a purchase order, but for certain reasons, companies prefer not to call it a purchase order because there are tax implications for it. I will not go into that. But what I will just tell you is that you will typically have to generate a document that tells your people overseas or your buying house overseas what exactly you want to buy what quantity, what specifications, blah, blah, blah. That would be called an overseas purchase requisition. In many instances, you would also have an estimate of what the pricing you're looking for should be um, because that will help to drive the other aspects of the trade, right? If you don't give people a sense of how much you expect to buy it for, then how can they, buy, they, how can they start to arrange financing for rate and the like? So those minimum details will be expected to be at that document. Now, once the overseas purchase requisition has been issued out to, let's, let's use in this instance a buying house because you are assuming that you don't have the specialty locally to import, but you have people sitting in a desk overseas that are able to then help you reach out to the suppliers directly. It has, I, I'm mentioning this because it makes life really, really simple for you. Number one, you need to be able to speak with two kinds of banks when you do international trade. Your issuing bank is one, but the correspondent bank is also very important. If you have no presence overseas, you tend to find that your communication with the correspondent bank is limited by the communication through the issuing bank. It will cripple you to an extent. Because don't forget that there are agency problems that arise. The issuing bank is looking out for its own commission. It doesn't really care about whether you get your goods or not on time or not on time, whether payment happens or they're more interested in whether you will commit the resources for them to handle the trade so that they can earn their own commission. So it's usually good to have some sort of presence in a country where you are importing these products from. And so assuming that your team overseas has now received the purchase requisition from the local team, they will send it out to the, buy, the company they want to buy from. That company will send them a performa invoice, which basically says, hey, we're happy to hear from you. Well, you know, we have exactly this product you want, the blue shoes um, that have, you know, that are made from lambskin. Uh, we can supply you a container load at a price of X, Y, Z. That's what your performa invoice will have. But remember, the performa invoice does not hit their PL. So they haven't sold anything to you. They're only telling you what kind of products they have, what pricing it will come at, et cetera, et cetera. And if there are any additional charges, it will be mentioned there. Now, with that performa invoice, the buying team overseas will send it over to the local team. Local team will then send that performa invoice for regulatory permits and you know, start to get shipping insurance. Um, and the idea is that you know, with the performa invoice, they, the bank can now start to populate the form M that is needed to process payments. Remember in Nigeria, to be able to establish LCs, you need to fill form M. Those form M's are filled by, um, they're, they're, like a, they're on a government portal that is controlled by, I believe the customs uh, agency. Um, the bank has some aspects of it that they handle, but then the customer can go online these days and populate some aspects of it. So most of the information you need to complete the process of generating the E form M will come from the performer invoice. 
uh, the name of the goods, the pricing, the quantity, blah, blah, the exchange, the currency it's being imported in and all of that. And that process will feed into the establishment of the LC or other payment modes. Now, once that's done, the customs agency will review your form M to be sure that, you know, it is in line with the government's regulations on importing that particular kind of product and then they will approve it. Now, once the LC has been established through the Form M that was completed and approved by the customs agency, then the supplier will get notification. And of course, this whole process happens with a lot of back and forth between the local team and the overseas team. Because when the initial pro forma invoice is generated, the overseas team, the local team might decide that, look, the pricing that the supplier is giving us on the basis of the exchange rates we are buying at and the current local prices, it may not work. So we might go back and say, look, give us a discount on this, give us X number of samples, give us this, that, 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 that performance advice might get revised five times or 10 times. And that's why I said the documentation is very, very challenging because you have to keep track of all these documents. If you get one performance invoice and you start completing a form M and then something happens and it changes, the government will want to know. They want to know why didn't this process complete? So you have to keep track of all of that. So once the supplier has gotten notification that the LCs or other payment modes have been, uh, you know, sort of completed, then they will start their process of, you know, dispatching the products to you, uh, to Nigeria. And then they will also start to present the shipping documents. Most LCs that, and I, when I say LCs, I'm sure you know I'm talking about letters of credit. Most letters of credit will specify that the shipping documents should be transmitted through the banks. So once the shipper has agreed that everything is in line and the bank, his own correspondent bank has notified him that, look, our, our communication to the issuing bank is that the money is ready or will be ready at the time that shipping uh, completes, then the, the exporter will load the goods on the ship and then send the shipping documents to his correspondent bank. Correspondent bank can transmit it to the local bank on conditions that it will not become um, uh, relevant until the shipment has happened. So supplier sends the original documents to his own bank, that bank sends it to the local bank, and then the bank pays the exporter upon receipt of the shipping documents. And why, why is the payment happening once the local bank receives the shipping document? Because in most instances, it's assumed that the moment the local bank has received the documents, that they can clear the goods whenever it arrives. They, they have the um, title to the goods has actually transmitted to the local bank. The local bank is not is receiving them on the behalf of his customer. So once he has the documents and he has shared with the customer, the customer says, okay, wow, that, that looks like it's all in order. He will issue payments to the uh, correspondent bank, who will then sort of hold it a little bit in escrow for the selling party. Um, and then, of course, the bank will then scan the shipping documents, the customs for generating uh, pre-arrival uh, documents, so pre-approval arrival documents, blah, blah, blah. There are, there's so many abbreviations in international trade that I'm not going to bore you with a lot of them, but they are called power documents or power processing. Um, and then once the bank has scanned those shipping documents or customs and then the shipping documents have been then are then sent to clearing agents for an assessment notice. That's also another specialized documentation that is generated. Uh, there are customs duties that will then need to be paid by the clearing agent, you know, to ensure that that cycle is completed with the customs agency. Um, and of course, the moment the goods then arrive, the bank would then release those documents to the buyer who then takes them over to the shipping agent and says, hey, I have the title to this document. Shipping agent says, awesome. I know that whoever provides this document to me is the owner, so here you are. And then he you know, releases that. Remember, these, um, this modality will change slightly depending on the terms of trade. Uh, if, so there will be instances where title will, and risk for documents will pass the moment the goods are loaded on the ship. In some instances, it will only change when the ship have arrived, has arrived at the destination port. You can read all that from the earlier slides. Now, there's also a process flow for exports, which is pretty similar, but um, uh, a little bit different in terms of documentation. So in the instance of exports, uh, you will typically send a pro forma invoice to the buyer and secure an export contract, just like you would have done if you were buying for the reverse. Um, and then you will then go ahead to process a Nigeria uh, NXP form, an export proceeds form, um, and then make the NESS fee payments. 
Uh, recently, the CBN decided to implement a program where exporters get a certain incentive, you know, if they're able to prove that they have shipped out certain products within a certain uh, quarter of the year. So those these documentation help you to prove that you actually exported the goods. So you, sum you submit a completed request for information and bill of leading declarations form to the inspections agents. Goods are inspected and issued a clean certificate of inspection by an inspection agent. You then submit the SGD or the single goods declaration form to customs. Um, on the basis of this, the goods are loaded into containers and then transported to the shipping line for transport to the importer. Uh, don't forget also that typically you would have done your GIT, so goods in transit insurance and you know ship the goods to Lagos. So depending on where the goods are being loaded from, you would want to have them insured from the loading points. Let's assume that you are importing sesame from Bauchi or from Jigawa. You would want to load them into a truck and then get goods in transit insurance. So GIT is goods in transit insurance. You will get that from Jigawa to Lagos. And then once it gets to Lagos, it gets transloaded into a ship uh, on the basis of the documentation that we just showed uh, on the other side of the slide. And then the goods then leave to the importer. Um, once you've done that, you will need to process post export and shipping documentation, which you will submit to the bank, just like you in the reverse instance, your supplier would have done to his own correspondent bank. So here, yeah, the local bank is the corresponding bank. They receive the goods. The bank collects payment upon receive of ex post export and shipping documentation to the importer. So your own bank is receiving payments from your supplier in this instance, whereas in importation, they are the ones pay, making the payment on your behalf to the buyer's bank. Um, and this, so this basically gives you a good example of what it entails. Now, I will add a caveat here that the, these documents typically tend to change a lot. Processes in import and export in Nigeria are never rigid. So there may be some slight tweaks to this currently that I have not inculcated here, but it just gives you a sense of what exactly it entails, right? Um, so when you do get into the field and you try to do some work on this, you may find that there are certain things you want to add to this and all that, but these are core concepts. Nelson, I don't know if at this point your questions have been answered. Yeah, I think they have been answered. Thanks a lot. Okay, so um, I mean, I don't want to go through all this again because we've already talked about them, bills for collection, letters of credit, advance payments. Um, I would add that, you know, so depending on what you're doing, in some instances, your shipments may happen by air freights. Um, you would, in those kind of instances, not be able to make those deferred long-term payments that go through the form M and the LC process. So most instances, you basically just transfer payments from your domiciliary account to the customer's account and then you know, close the matter. Um, but yeah, uh, history of international trades, I won't go into this. I think we spent a lot of time today. It's a Sunday, so I really want you guys to be able to go and get some rest. Uh, read this on your own. But the idea here is just that it gives you an outline of how trade has progressed over time. So our case study was supposed to be in Kashu, uh, in, in global Kashu trade. Um, I, I will just talk a little bit about it because most of it is outlined on the slide. Um, so here, in essence, what we are trying to capture is that the processing capacity for cashew is actually mostly in India and Vietnam. If you look at the chart, you see that 37% of processing happens in India, 48% in Vietnam. If you sum that up, that brings you to, you know, 85% uh, of processing. So if 85% of, you know, the entire processing in the world is happening in those two countries, you can tell that there are powerhouses for this. But the interesting thing is that 60% of those same cashew nuts are actually produced in Africa. And yet only 5% is processed in Africa. So that tells you that there's a big problem because every time you have to ship a product out to a different country for them to process, then you are losing a whole lot of value, right? So that's the picture in terms of production and processing. Now, in terms of consumption, it's also, you know, the same skewed picture. So India consumes almost 50%. And then the rest of it, nearly you know, 47% of it is, is consumed in Europe and America. So very little cashew nuts are consumed in Africa. A lot of it is produced here, but all of it is processed in other countries. Very, very little processing happens in Africa. 
And what has this sort of done? So in essence, you have these African countries which produce at different times in the year. So Tanzania is unique because Tanzania's cashew nuts come out in the late part of the year, maybe around October, November. But then in, let's say, Benin Republic and Nigeria, process production happens or the harvest season starts in late January and early February. So because Tanzania is in a different um, well, harvest season, they tend to enjoy that advantage because by the time their product is coming to the market, you find that the rest of the production markets have sort of dried up. But what tends to happen is that almost all of it gets shipped to these two countries. You know, a lot of volumes processed in India, a lot of volumes in Vietnam. And that's what we just tried to capture here. Now, uh, because India has such a large consumer market for cash flows, their government has taken a lot of steps to ensure that they protect their market. You know, so they make sure that processors in India have access to subsidized funds. They are Processing industry is protected with a 70% duty on the importation of cashew kernels. Now, um, the kernels are that edible part of the cashew uh, nuts that is pro produced after you have opened the shell. I don't know if some of you as children ever um, roasted cashew, cashew nuts outside. So when you roast it and you break it, the shell comes apart and then you have a nut that you can eat. So that uh, part you can eat inside is called the kernel, and then the outer part is called the shell. So what India has basically said is, if you want to import cashew into our country, we're well, fine if it's the raw cashew nut. But the moment you do any form of processing, then we will charge you 70% duty on it. Because they do not want you to generate any finished product that will come into their country. So they want to be able to import the raw nuts from Africa, process it in India, and consume it in India. And that way, they are able to trap the value within India. Now, they also stop the importation of semi-processed cashew, which is called Borma, into India, um, partly because a lot of exporters started to do some very shady things. They would mix in the kernels into the shell and call it Borma, and then you know, claim that it is unprocessed, blah, blah, blah. So the Indian government cut wind of it and immediately blocked any semi-processed one. So it's either you are bringing it in as nuts, meaning that it is raw from the farm, no processing has happened, they will charge you uh, an import duty of just 5%, um, very minimal, so it comes in. And, you know, and then, of course, don't forget from the slides we looked at that India does produce quite a significant quantity of cashew nuts. So here, for example, we're seeing about 800,000 tons of cashew nuts produced there. But what they have done is to ensure that while they know that they produce quite a significant quantity, they don't want to allow other markets to then ship in finished goods into their country, which their people will consume because they consume a very large portion of global cashew nuts. Um, they give incentives on export of kernels. So one thing that you can do in India is you can bring in the nuts, you can process it, and then you can export it to the other countries and earn an incentive on it. Um, this is, you know, their own way of ensuring that the jobs are trapped in India. So you bring in the raw material, you process it, and you export it, and the government gives you, you know, an incentive for exporting the processed nuts. Uh, and then, of course, there are machine manufacturers, you know, have access to subsidized funds. They've been doing this for years, so the machinery is cheaper and all that. But what's the impact? The impact is that your, their processing cost is half that of African processors, and they have ready access to, you know, trained workers and, you know, manufacturing machinery. And that also means that in the long run, Africa is unable to compete with India in cash value chain. So now, I think that's not bad enough. If you take a case study of the Republic, for example, Benin produces about 130,000 tons of cashew nuts per annum. Like 80% of that cashew nuts is exported. But guess what? That 80% is actually mostly all raw nuts. Very little processing happening. They have up to 35,000 tons of processing capacity. But believe me, at most points in the year, those factories are either shut down, moribund, or processing partially. They are not able to be full capacity. And why is that so? Um, partly because there is no policy support from the government. So what just happens is that the government allows you to export the nuts. They even penalize you for processing. Um, so, you know, you will have instances where, for example, um, because they have what's called a purchase campaign, they can 
can allow you to come to the market and purchase cashews between a certain window in the year. Maybe they might say that the, post, the purchase campaign starts on the 10th of January and ends on the 30th of January. You are expected to buy all your cashew nut requirements as a process of between that window. So your carrying costs become much higher. And then what then happens is that the vast majority of people who come into India, Benin to buy the cashew nuts are actually Indian traders who have come in they will buy the nuts, ship it, pack it, or um, stop it into containers and then export it straight to India. And the government doesn't do anything to incentivize the processors who have invested in facilities in India. You know, uh, and so, so you find that a lot of the nuts are exported raw. The country gets very little value addition. The farmers are poor. You know, jobs are stolen from the people. The factories lie moribund, and this is all as a result of the fact that the government has not realized that this is a valuable value chain to, you know, sort of uh, invest time and resources to protect. Um, second case study would be rice. Um, I, I think this this slide was built in 2017, so you'd have to bear with me. Okay, I see a hand raised. Thank you very much, Dr. Charlie. Uh, what you just described uh, with the cashew nut, of course, is pathetic and uh, is worrisome. But is it possible for us to also look at it from, uh, let's say, what could have been done? Assuming uh, one of us becomes a policymaker, you know, what can we do? Hmm. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's, it's exactly the same things we've talked about from the beginning, right? Which is that, first of all, you need to prioritize value chains where you have a, either a comparative or an absolute advantage. Um, what we've said so far is that the vast supply of cashew nuts comes from Africa. So what that means is that you do have a bit of advantage. The rest of the world can produce all the cashew nuts they need. And if that's the case, then you really need to then protect that industry and ensure that you can trap the value addition within your territory. So yes, you grow cashew nuts, but we know that that's never enough. You need to now invest and incentivize people to invest in processing those uh, materials within the country. And there are a couple of ways today we've talked about, you know, um, on the one hand, protecting your country from not allowing imports to come in. But on the other hand, you also want to ensure that you are incentivizing the people whenever they make investments to be able to earn good returns on those investments. Uh, and then, of course, you know, since you know very well that there are different kinds of exports happening, either the raw nuts or the kernels, want to incentivize the exportation of the value-added products, right? Um, when you think about it, that should not undergo various forms of processing. So the very first level will be the, the shelling process, where you remove the shell and you now have the kernel. But beyond that, there's also a value chain for roasting it, and in some cases, even seasoning the, the nuts themselves, and maybe in some instances, even mixing them up with other kinds of nuts so that you can have you know, a richer protein profile, which people look for in these nuts. And once you have that all put together, then in those instances, you will not only protect that industry, but you will also incentivize more people to go in because they now earn better from it. Um, but yeah, same concepts we've been talking about, um, but I'm just giving you an example of a place where it hasn't worked because the government hasn't really prioritized that industry and hasn't sat down to do their homework about why this is valuable. All right, so rice. Um, so, sorry, sorry, Charlie, sorry, Charlie, uh, to drag you back a little bit. Uh, you know, why I'm raising this point is that, um, you know, someone said that have education that be better than is was that ignorance, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. um, a, a lot of government efforts have, you know, been delivered to try to reverse some of these traits, but some of them have not been successful, maybe because they are not holistic enough, you know, or that they are not aggressive enough, you know? So do you think that um, this policy, you know, interventions are, you know, that simplistic or are there really other complex factors that need to be considered in implementing them so that our students don't leave with the impression that, oh, it's just so easy, just come there and ban X, Y, Z, you know, do X, Y, Z, and then it's all start changing the status quo. Um, I mean, the way I would answer this is to say that there's nothing that is usually very simple. These are complex systems. Um, 
in many instances, I think there are early conversations that need to be had between you know various governments. So in this particular instance, I don't see any reason why Nigeria or any of the other cashew producing countries can not sit down with governments in Vietnam and India and try to understand ways that we can leverage multilateral trade to deliver value for Nigerian cashew farmers. Um, so that would be one approach, one bucket of approaches. Now, there will be trade-offs, of course, and you know maybe some even negative externalities that could arise. But I, I, my point here was really that the level of engagement that needs to happen hasn't even started to happen. So we haven't even come to a point where we're able to start seeing those complex issues arise. What's just happening, especially in the Benin Republic case, is that and I could go into some of the other nitty gritties of the politics of it, but since this is a recorded presentation, there's really no point in that. Um, but we know that there are some issues that have arisen that have made it quite difficult for the government to act in interest, best interest of its people in this particular instance. That's been quite unfortunate. Uh, I don't know if I've addressed your point or if you... Oh, sure, 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 you have, sure you have. Thank you. Okay. So Rice, um, I mean, I think you've seen the information on the slide, it's been on for a while now. Um, but the essence was that, you know, a lot of the rice that was consumed in Nigeria prior to 2017 was really, really, uh, you know, poor quality rice shipped in by all sorts of funny means. You know, you can see boats in the corner, you can see trucks. Um, and then, you know, even on bikes at a point, that it became a thing, you know, where people were shipping in um, finished rice on motorcycles. I mean, you can think of how inefficient that exportation, that importation process must have been. But the point was that the margins that were possible were so high that it could allow for that kind of very inefficient transport methodology. And that's what happens. We've, we've talked about this in detail. Um, I just wanted to share a slide I have done at this point. Okay, yeah, that's fine. But basically, it just shows you um, some of the information we were able to garner at the time about you know, consumption of rice in Nigeria and Benin, and then the kind of importation that was happening. Just to buttress the point that it was clear that the rice that was being imported into Benin was basically intended for Nigeria. Um, because the moment we um, uh, we banned the importation of rice into the country, you know, you, we basically, the, Nigeria, for example, passed the technical ban on importation in 2013. And then the moment that happened, you know, you saw a surge in the amount of importation of rice into the Republic. And interesting thing is that even till today, the Republic doesn't consume parboiled rice so much. They, they consume mostly white rice. And yet they were importing such phenomenal volumes of parboiled rice. And it was just clear to everybody that this was rice that was intended to then get transshipped across the land border into Nigeria. Um, I'm not sure if I will be able to go into these slides, but in essence here, we were trying to look at, you know, uh, how much subsidies are spent across various countries, you know, in the agricultural space. Um, and in this slide, we basically try to highlight the various kinds of commodities that countries sort of subsidize. And here you'll see that rice was phenomenally high um, in the period that was being studied. And it's been so for quite a long time. So governments would, in most instances, would invest large volumes of funds to ensure that their farmers can produce commodities which would then get shipped down to Nigeria and all that. Uh, most of this you read on your own. And uh, yeah, I think I basically come to the end of this class. Um, I am sure that there's a lot to learn if you will spend some time to go through the slides later on. There's also a lot to do a bit of research on um, because I didn't cover everything. International trade is a very, very complex subject. I'm sure that there are people who do this as a whole degree uh, in the university. But what I've just done, done is try to compile a lot of that information in one document so that you can read through it and be conversant with the issues. 
Now, if you speak with somebody about the international trade, you'll be able to converse intelligently, you should be able to speak about the issues and, and how they arise, and then you know, profile intelligent solutions to problems. So I don't know if there's any question at this point. I have now covered exactly two hours of class, uh, and I think I'm sure everybody's exhausted at this point. So it'd be good to allow you guys to go get some rest. Um, but if you have any more questions, I can just field those in the next few minutes. Good evening, sir. Good evening. My name is Chibuzo. Okay, hi Chibuzo. Yes, sir. I have quite a number of questions. Um, okay. although I wanted to ask um, why the cost of clearance for most goods for import is quite high, significantly high. Um, but then along the line, you cleared it. But then I want to know, what does the government do with these um, costs, with these um, um, fees? What do they do with it? Um, That's I mean, one. Okay. Okay, so I also want to know um, the difference between gross imports and normal imports. That's imports and gross imports, because in the um, database for World Bank, they kind of highlighted two types of imports, the gross imports and the and imports. So I want to know, uh, and um, in terms of um, the figures, I noticed that there is quite um, slight um, difference in those figures. Is there a specific difference between the two that's same as gross export and exports too okay um yeah so your first question was around what governments do with the revenues they earn um and yeah i mean in an ideal situation government does with revenues what it does with any other form of revenue. They will typically have accounted for it in the budgets for the year, and then it will typically go into infrastructure projects. Right? Um, I'm not sure if your question is more specific to Nigeria, in which case I honestly I don't have the answer. I, I'm sure that the money goes somewhere. Uh, but exactly what we do with it, uh, you will need to speak with somebody in government to sort of answer that. Um, Maybe I didn't get the question. So if, if my answer is not satisfying, maybe you can restate the question in some way and I will try to answer. Um, and then your other question was around gross imports. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, so it, it, remember your question is now more a data collection question, right? When governments try to collate data around, you know, trade, it can be very messy because even though we've discussed it on very simplistic terms, sometimes you will have products that get exported and re-imported and then re-exported and all of that. And there is no way to cate categorize all that information separately. So, for example, even though we import rice or we used to import rice a lot, it didn't mean that there was no export of rice happening at all at that time. There were, it was small, very tiny, but it existed. So you'll find that if you want to capture importation exclusively, um, it would be a bit tricky unless you now try to understand whether that data accounts for an adjustment of the exportation value or whether there are re-exportation happening. So for example, some of the rice that was coming into Nigeria may have actually come in and then gone back into some other countries like Niger Republic or maybe Cameroon or some other neighboring country. So in those instances, even though you call them, uh, you call what you are exporting an export, we know also that the origin was an importation. So to answer your question, there are ways that this data is categorized just to ensure that we export. So for example, with gross exports, you will be looking at a summation of exports and re-export values, right? Uh, so that basically this number would not be a cleaned up number. It would be a number that includes certain double counting. Because if the product was exported, brought back in and re-exported, we know that if you count it, you are counting it twice. So those numbers will be a gross figure. 
But then when you clean it up a little bit, then those will be called, you know, pure importation or pure exportation numbers. I don't know if that's possible. It's a data collection problem. Gross figures are unclean information that basically says it is the aggregate of everything that went out. But how did it really go out? Did it come in first before going out or did it go out and come back in before going out again? Nobody knows. All we know is that we counted the number and that's what we saw. So if a gross import or gross export of rice was 10,000 tons, it's possible that out of that 10,000 tons, maybe 2,000 tons was double, double counted because it was exported then re-imported then exported again. So when we exported the first time, we counted, let's say 8,000 tons. But then out of that 8,000 tons, another 2,000 tons was re-imported back, then exported again. So when I counted the second export, I got 2,000. So my total gross export would be 10,000 tons. But I know that isn't the actual figure because some portion of it was re-exported. So that's a gross figure. Does it make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I saw someone else raise their hands. So we'll just take one more question. Um, uh, is that was there anybody else who raised their hand? Yes, sir. I'm doing hello, sir. Yes, please go ahead. Introduce yourself and go ahead. Okay, my name is Le Cola. Okay. Um about this uh, international trading, I uh, I've listened to the lecture and it's very, very interesting. It's an eye opener. But there's something that bothers me, like as a person, as, a, as an African, that yeah. we, as an African, is it that, because as, as everything is going, we saw it on paper that is as very simple as CBC, a, a country that is not producing, that always allows its uh, end product to be processed as we are is losing a lot but still yet we in i want to use africa as a whole because i know most of the products here are in africa and the europeans the americans the chinese they came here take our products away and process it and bring it back to us they mm. break where we are supposed to have the gain in the, process, yeah. in the chain process, they break it and they return the finished product for us. Now, um, I, what I'm, my question is this, is, is, is just my own thinking. Yeah. Is there any, what is really wrong with us? Why can't we get it right? Um, I mean, it's a simple question and it's a valid question, but the answer is also quite simple. It's a failure in leadership. Unfortunately, trade cannot happen effectively without coordination. That's why, for example, you will typically have organizations called market associations. They help to you know, enforce, enforce efficiency in a market. Um, if your country, your government does not sit down to prioritize certain value chains and make certain decisions and put certain limitations, what would end up happening is that other people will take advantage. It's an open you know, field. Uh, the people who are coming and taking products to process abroad, they are, not, they are doing it because it's in their best interest. And they're only doing it because you permit them to do it. If you make the laws up in such a way that you know, they can't do it anymore, then it will change. So it's a problem, but it's also a very simple problem to fix. All you need is political will, the right people to come in that have thought about this well enough and that will go ahead to make the difficult decisions and say, look, this can't happen this must happen, et cetera. Once those rules are laid out, those guys will play according to the rules. Yeah? All right, sir. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. All right. Uh, I think I see another hand raised. Yeah, hello, Charlie, that's me. Charlie, uh, please permit me to uh, extend your session. I know uh, you want us round up, but please just to um, chip in for the class. I have a bottle of cashew here with me, and I don't think it's up to, let's say, 200 grams. And I bought that 200 grams for 3,000 naira. So it means that uh, one kg will be 15,000 naira per kg, and one ton will be 15 million of finished uh, unprocessed cashew nut, just to give an example. So Coastal Nigeria is exporting about 100,000 tons 
of uh, cashew every year minimum. So you're talking about uh, one raised to power 12, 1.5 raised to power 12. That is about 1.5 trillion of uh, cashew nut, process value of cashew nut. If we consider the fact that the average productivity in the agricultural value chain could be 2.5 million, but that I'm referring to the average amount uh, somebody in that agri sector might earn in a year, it means that you have a potential of 600,000 jobs spotted just on the cash flow value chain. So the reason why I, I felt to go that route is that sometimes when we're having these conversations, it might look abstract. You know, we're just saying that the policies uh, that people make, government make, uh, either wisely or wisely, have real practical implications. In other words, there are about 600,000 Nigerians that could have been employed profitably in the uh, cashew value chain if we got our acts right. We can do this for, for rice, could do this for cocoa, could do this for uh, cotton, could do this for ginger, you know, we just think through across the value chain. And you know, see the colossal waste in human resource. And part of the reason why we're having this session, part of the reason why we felt this, this should be discussed is that all of us here in this room, by virtue of this knowledge, you have a decision to make. You know, you could wake up and say it doesn't concern you, and this has nothing to do with you, and, or you can do nothing about it. Or you could ask yourself, what can I, as an agent of change, begin to do? Which industry can I attack? Which part of this value chain must I be part of those that will engineer its development? Charles has done a great job on the rice value chain, which I would love him to, if he has time, to tell us some of the work that's on the rice value chain, you know? But that's just one value chain, rice. That's cocoa. There's cotton, there's ginger, there's cashew, there's uh, lithium, there's cobalt, there's gold. These are all value chains that Nigeria have some level of competitive advantage. So we are discussing real life matters that have consequences for your brothers, your sisters, people that you know. But the question is, who and who will take the responsibility? I don't know if you understand, I don't know if you guys get where I'm coming from. That we don't want this lecture to just be an um, in informational session. This is why this is where we are losing the war. National trade is where Nigeria is losing the war. In fact, because national trade is actually war by other means. So, uh, Charlie, I don't know if um, I'm expanding the scope of your task, but if you don't mind, if you, you know, help us share some light or some, some of your experiences in the rise value chain. And yeah, um, so, yeah, sorry about that. I, I will have to do that at another session or something. I have okay. a very urgent call to take. So okay. what I will do is, um, I mean, somebody should take note of it. I have another session with you guys. Uh, so I can always sort of add that to what I will cover that day and then we will talk about that as well. Yeah. Okay, and then... Um, Stay with me. No, no, no problem, Charlie. And then uh, maybe after Charlie's session, after Charles has bowed out, if you guys would mind, I would take another 15 minutes to just stress up us, um, to, to help you make the most of this session and this opportunity we'll have of having Charles here with us. Uh, the class has been very quiet. Okay, um, I don't think it's, uh, it's intentional. Maybe Somebody it's wants to ask one question, sir. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. That just has the call to take, so be quite. Yeah, no, so could you let me just quickly take that if it's something short? Um, I just have a few minutes, so yeah, why not? Okay, um, hello, yeah. okay, so my... sorry, I think somebody was trying to say something. Hold on, okay, go ahead. Hello. Go ahead, can hear you now. Okay. Okay, so my question is, um, so I have, um, I started a small business, right? And then the business I started, capital, I'm, I'm using myself as an example, capital is not a problem. So okay. someone see, someone um, hears about the business and is interested in it and ask if he, if, if he can um, come in. And, I'm, and I say yes. Now, the person is coming with capital, right? Okay. To, mm -hmm. to, to push the business forward. 
because it seems like I was talk. So now in the in the sharing of I don't know if it's shares now I'll call it for the company because it has to be registered as a company which was supposed to be like a joint effort. Like okay, since he's coming in as an investor, like in the sharing, is this supposed to be equal? Because um, from the person's um, perspective, I'm 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 the brain behind it, yes, but then he is a person like funding it and, you know, doing most of the, like buying the equipment needed and everything. So all I have in the, in the business, my stake in the business is just the idea and then the production of the product, the product okay. itself. So, and so, so my point was, um, mm -hmm. my point was, um, okay, since you're coming in, we can go 50-50. But the person is like, no, he has to take a higher share. So I want to understand the, I don't know if it's right. I, I, yeah, that's the question. Yeah, I mean, I can tell it's a pressing matter. And I would just say that you are in the right place, the EMP program. By the time you're done with this course, you should be able to have a very intelligent conversation.